Hello, everyone. Today, I want to talk to you about some of the techniques and approaches to identifying interpolations in ancient texts, particularly biblical texts. And that would be when a later author has inserted something into the text. Now, that happens often with phrases here and there. We call that textual criticism, where you would have two copies of, say, the Gospel of Mark from different periods, manuscripts, in other words, and they wouldn't read exactly the same, and you have to compare the differences. And the assumption is one reading is more original than the other, and then the question is, how would you identify the basic primary text and then the secondary text, something that's been added? But I'm not going to deal with little phrases. I want to deal with chunks of text where someone has really put in a significant amount of material that would then raise a flag or overwritten a text extensively like a heavy-handed editor would do. And this particular video on spotting interpolations, you might say, is related to the other mini-series that I'm doing, Lost in Translation. So I'm going to share my screen, and let me explain the overview of what I have in mind as we look at these various ancient texts that I've been covering. I guess you could call this reading ancient, mostly biblical texts, techniques and strategies. In other words, how do you go about doing it? Lost in translation, I've made half dozen videos on this idea. It's just where texts are mistranslated and therefore misunderstood, misinterpreted, misapplied, and lead to all kinds of things that have nothing to do with what the text is really saying. And that's very common. I could do this for a year or two every day, and there would be more and more because translations are notoriously bad because they tend to build upon theological traditions so that there's something at stake in how you translate something in order to get across a certain dogmatic point of view. Secondly, and that's this video, uh, identifying interpolations. How do you know when someone has inserted something that is not the original author, not just a variant, but I'm thinking of chunks of material, as I said. And I also, as we go along, I want to start talking about embedded text, a kind of intertextuality, not something that's inserted by someone else that would be an interpolation, but the author where he or she actually has other sources that they bring in, and those two sources begin to relate to one another, and one builds upon the other, and they become like scrambled eggs all together, a kind of what we call intertextuality, embedded text, and then derivative texts. There I'm thinking of something like the book of Daniel, rewritten book of Revelation in the New Testament, then second Esdras, part of the Apocrypha, you're essentially doing over and over the same kind of visionary material, but there are three or four versions of it. We also find this in some of the Enoch materials and other kinds of materials where there's a whole tradition. We talk about Enochian Judaism, where there's a whole set of texts that unfold and one might build upon the other. This building could be new insights. It could actually be the newer, more recent text disagreeing with the old text or whatever. And then I want to do something on how do you identify forgeries? People are writing me all the time, and there have been things in the news lately, and, and there have been things on social media and streaming platforms about different texts that clearly are forgeries, like did you know that there's these letters that Pontius Pilate wrote to the Emperor Tiberius about Jesus? Or did you know there's a Roman official and a text that's been suppressed and kept from you that describes all about Jesus and what he looked like and so forth? How do you know that a text is ancient or a later forgery? And there are plenty of those. There are more forgeries than there are what we would consider 
genuine texts, meaning texts that we can trace back to an author. So that's what we're doing in general. That's the overview. So today I'm going to take two texts, identifying interpolations and in biblical texts. So we're dealing with that second category today. And here's a map of Greece from the ancient world. And here you can see Athens, the capital. Corinth is just to the south and to the west, and it's on an isthmus, so that it has the double port from the east and the west. So I want to talk about the text we know as 1 Corinthians, but also a text that these are both from the Apostle Paul, where Paul wrote to a group that he had raised up and created uh, of early followers of Jesus in Thessalonica, Salonica, as it's called today. So that's up to the north in Macedonia. And then he travels down to Athens and then to Corinth. So here are the two texts. One is from Thessalonians. If you want to read the account we have of Paul in Thessalonica, the city of Thessalonica, it's Acts 17, 1 through 9. So very short. He was only there a few weeks. He preached in the synagogue. He had Jewish opposition, as you might expect. And he was essentially run out of town or he, he just fled to save his life because he had a lot of enemies dogging his tracks. So we begin with that. And then we're going to look at Corinth. And that's actually in the next chapter, uh, Acts chapter 18, 18 verses. Both of these come from around the 50s AD. Now, this section of First Thessalonians, you know, these chapters and verses were added later, but that's how we can refer to things. So chapter 2, as we call it today, beginning in verse 14, I'll read it. For you, brethren, he's writing back to these believers that he had baptized and established as a little beachhead church in the city of Thessalonica. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. So in the homeland, in the land of Israel, in Judea, where James, the brother of Jesus, presides over the entire movement, as well as Peter and John being two of the other pillars or chief apostles of the Jesus followers. So he's saying, you, you imitated the churches of God in Judea. Now, how did they imitate them? By suffering. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen, native Greek Macedonians, where they lived, as they did from the Jews. He's Jewish, and it's a Jewish movement, but he refers to the Jews as the Jews, like the other, who kill both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displease God and oppose all men by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. In other words, these Jews who oppose us, they are just always sinful, and this is the last straw where they sin and sin and sin and fill up the measure of their sins. And then look at this. But God's wrath has come upon them at last, exclamation mark, in English at least. But it seems to be well-deserved even in the Greek, which doesn't have exclamation marks. Now, why would this be considered an interpolation? By many, many scholars, major scholars, I won't name names, but a couple of the names are very big. There are a lot of scholars of Paul who say this was added later, as Jews begin to break more and more from the Christian movement. And remember, there's a time when Christians were Jews. And yes, Gentiles were invited in, but it was essentially a Jewish movement. And first of all, it's a Jewish movement within the varieties of Judaism of the period, and it can even spread out into what's called the diaspora, the Roman world, and still remain fairly Jewish. I mean, when Paul baptizes someone in Thessalonica, and they've been attending one of the pagan temples in the city, and now they began meeting with this fledgling little group of believers in Jesus as the Messiah, 
They're going to learn about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the Torah and the prophets. And Paul will quote the Holy Scriptures, as he calls them, from the Hebrew Bible. So they're being Judaized in that sense, from a broader cultural sense. They're being brought into a form of faith in the one God of Israel and salvation, because Paul believes the apocalyptic wrath of God is coming soon. So what is the problem with these Jewish opponents of Paul and of the movement? They hinder us, and he's talking specifically about his work, his ministry, as it's sometimes called, speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved. And as you go on to read 1 Thessalonians, it is so apocalyptic. I mean, basically, you get the idea that Paul thinks Jesus is going to appear in the clouds of heaven anytime, suddenly, maybe like next week, next month, certainly in a year or so. It's very, very apocalyptic. So why would scholars think this is an interpolation? Many. Because it's so nasty. Because it's vindictive. And because it singles out the Jews as the other, the alien that is opposing us as the new movement of Christianity. And as Paul says, the new Israel, and in fact, he would say the true Israel. He says, essentially to his followers, we are the true circumcision. We are the true Jews, spiritually speaking. Now, I don't think this qualifies as a clear interpolation, so it's tough to identify these. People are going to differ. I think Paul wrote this. If you read the context before and after, it looks to me like it's seamless. One of the things interpolators do is they find a little space that they can wedge something in. As I read, chapter 2 doesn't seem to have that at all. Before and after, and I think Paul would say this. If you trust the account in the book of Acts, Acts 17, his Jewish enemies are after him and they want to kill him. So this is not a anti-Semitic statement. It could be used that way later, and it was. And I think that's why some scholars just would like to say that was added later. And, and it shouldn't be really attributed to Paul. Paul wouldn't say this. Well, I think Paul would say this. And he's talking about some very acute suffering. This is essentially one Jewish party or movement against another one. And these are power plays. It's what Morton Smith called parties and politics in the late Second Temple period. There's all kinds of parties and politics. If you read the Dead Sea Scrolls, they say things much worse than this about the Jerusalem Temple. And... You know, most people wouldn't say the Dead Sea Scrolls are anti-Semitic. So this is not classically anti-Semitic. It reflects a very serious conflict, essentially, between these various Jewish groups. Uh, we think that Paul was primarily followed and opposed by the Pharisees, who control some of the synagogues and Paul's coming into their territory and their terrain and essentially pulling people off. And even the Gentiles that have been going to the synagogue, and remember, Gentiles went to every synagogue. In fact, we think up to a third of the synagogue was non-Jews getting attracted to the idea of the God of Israel, the basic ethics of the Torah, like the Ten Commandments, that many non-Jews, or in this case, Greeks, found very attractive. So I don't think this is an interpolation. Now let's look at this one. It has some similar elements to it. This is 1 Corinthians. You can read about Corinth, as I said, in Acts 18. Now Paul stays there for almost two years. So this is a long stay. He finally feels that he needs to leave, but he actually leaves because he wants to go on and continue his travels and his preaching work and so forth. So he's giving all kinds of instructions to the Corinthians. And if you read the letter as a whole, uh, the different corrections and instructions are quite harsh. And yet this one is seen as very harsh and not really becoming of Paul.
even though everybody says Paul hates women and Paul's against women, he actually says things like in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek bond or free slave or free male or female. You're all one in Christ and so forth. And Jesus had talked about in the age to come, the resurrection, there won't be male and female and marriage and so forth. But as he puts it, those who are worthy to obtain to that age and to the resurrection of the dead will live in a transformed state with new glorious bodies, very much like angels, but actually above angels. That was Paul's idea. So here he's writing to the Corinthian church, and we'll read it. As in all the churches of the saints, saints here just means followers of Jesus. It's not a special category of really, really holy people. It's everybody. It means to be set apart or sanctified from the world, basically. The women should keep silent in the churches, churches being the assembly. They didn't have buildings. For they're not permitted to speak. Wow, that's pretty strict. But should be subordinate, as even the Torah says. Now, these Gentiles, Paul says, are not under the Torah, but here he uses the Torah teaching to say women are subordinate to men. And clearly he's thinking of the book of Genesis, where Adam is made and then Eve is derived from Adam. And there's a text in Genesis, chapter 3, where Eve is told, your desire will be to the man and he will rule over you. So that's what Paul has in mind here. Let's go on. If there's anything they desire to know, because somebody might say they can't even ask a question, let them ask their husbands at home. Notice they've got to wait till they get home. Now, he doesn't say, what do you do if they don't have a husband? Presumably, they would ask their father or their parents, uh, whatever their home is. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in the assembly. And then he says, what? Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? And then he goes on to say, this is my rule in all the churches and so forth. And he's trying to stress, this is the policy I follow. Women are subordinate and should be silent. Now, in Paul's later letters that most of us don't think Paul individually wrote, but they come from a Pauline tradition or, or a Pauline school, you do find this idea that women should be silent and subservient to men. But other than this passage, Paul's early letters, uh, what we call the seven early letters or the seven authentic letters of Paul, and those seven would be 1 Thessalonians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, and Philemon. But in the other letters, the later letters, you began to get this subservient idea of women being silent. So should it be in 1 Corinthians? So did somebody stick this in later as an interpolation into Paul's earlier letter? Because this is 1 Corinthians, probably written uh, 54 AD or something like that, in order to get the idea into that early material so it would harmonize with the later. And many, many scholars have convinced of that. Again, I don't think it's an interpolation. I think it fits Paul very well. He thinks the end is very near. None of these things are even going to matter. And in this very letter, he says that. He says, the things of this world are passing away. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, not to even get married. Don't go into business. The appointed time of the end is very short. He says the form or the schema of the world is passing away. So he thinks everything's going to be changed soon. And so whether you're a man or a woman, or whether you're a Jew or a Greek, or whether you're a slave or a free person in the Roman Empire, it doesn't matter. It's all going to go away very soon. So I think he's trying to just establish order. And this reflects the practice of synagogues. And he wants the Jewish culture as a whole to look on his work favorably and his people favorably, that they're following the basic traditions of Jewish culture. He also talks about uh, covering heads and all of that kind of thing in terms of the women in the assembly. So back to my question, how do you identify interpolations? I chose these examples 
to actually muddy the water and say it's kind of complicated because sometimes these two cases, I think, it depends on your presuppositions. You do want to put it back into the context. And if you put both of these into the context of the letter of First Thessalonians and when it was written, probably right around 50, 51 CE, and the letter of First Corinthians, as I said, 54 CE or AD, and what Paul's doing and what he's all about, the apocalyptic Paul is going to explain a lot. In my book, Paul and Jesus, I go into this thoroughly. I have a chapter called Already, Not Yet. And the idea there would be, according to Paul, that we're already getting a foretaste of the world to come, of the transformed lives that we will experience in the heavenly kingdom of God when it comes upon the earth. His followers are already getting a foretaste of the age to come. They're not there yet, but they can already anticipate it. But in the meantime, you're still in the old world. And so you have to respect the culture of the society that is passing away, is passing, but has not yet passed. So I wouldn't take these out. And I will give you other examples of interpolations that I think should be taken out. And you can look back in the introductory video where I began to talk about some of those already. So everyone take care. And I hope you see my little friend here. I love you, sweetie. And I hope you see my little friend here. That's actually her head. She's a border doodle. So she's Kali and Poodle, and she is uh, smarter than I am by far. Amazing creature. And she's listening to me now talk to all of you. I'll see you next time, and we'll continue this textual analysis on these various levels. is the urban capital of the entire Galilee.